All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We've been having a little bit of technical difficulties. We're going to try this and see if it works. Um, my name is Eva Montaigne. I work here in marketing at Ignatius Press. And I'm here today to introduce you to a very dear friend of mine who I met probably like 15 <laughs> years ago at um, Walk for Life West Coast, which we, a group of us here in San Francisco, organized and started. And we met Walter and his wonderful wife, Lori, um, the second year of the Walk for Life. And we've been dear friends ever since. And I've been honored to be with him on his walk through <laughs> jail. Uh, I was there for his hearings, for his trial. I also visited <laughs> him in the jail. So without further ado, Walter, why don't you uh, very briefly just tell everyone what happened back then and how you ended up in jail? Oh my goodness. Eva, I love you. And let me say that it all started with a phone call from my friends in the Catholic Church. They had, they had an idea that it would be hard to walk by a pastor, a priest, a deacon, an elder, a preacher on the way into abortion clinic. So I was the first one. I went out there and I'm literally standing on a public sidewalk holding a sign that says, God loves you and your baby. Let us help you. Oh, my goodness. And sure enough, the, the women would stop. They'd say, hey, preacher, is, is it true that God loves me? Is it true that God loves my baby? And I say, yes, yes. And then she'd look at me real hard and say, well, if all that's true, will you help me? And that's just what I did. It didn't matter what she needed. We helped her. And oh, my goodness, that made all the difference in the world. So many changed their mind. God bless you, Walter. And so because you were doing such great work, what happened to get you in trouble? Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, it, it was really great where it was, I was very popular. I mean, on uh, one day we had uh, 27 appointments at the clinic. Now there's no way they could do appointment, 27 appointments in a two hour time frame on that single day, but the women weren't coming to get an abortion. They were coming to get help. They heard it was a preacher on the side of the sidewalk that was actually, was actually helping, helping them. them. Well, that was draining all the business from the abortion clinic. And so ultimately they worked with the mayor, the city council, the chief of police, the executive director of the abortion clinic and the leader of the abortion clinic escorts, we call them death courts. And they literally created a law in Oakland to put me in jail. It's, it's absolutely an amazing story because I was, uh, this is the book by the way, uh, Black and Pro-Life in America. And it is such a detailed book. I was rereading it again to get ready for to talk to you tonight. And it's amazing the, the detail that it goes into. It gives all the names and all the times and dates and who said what and who did what. And, and the fact is that they literally made this law because of you. They were out to make sure to silence you because you were so effective. And that's, there's no way around that. I think even they have to admit that the entire law was created because how successful you were. And so basically, Walter, then what happened? So you, the, the city created this law and what did you do at that time? Well, oh my goodness. I, I really didn't think that I would ever go to jail. I mean, my goodness, I'm on the sidewalk, got a sign that says God loves you and I'm actually helping the women. But sure enough, I find myself in court. We're in court and my goodness, the only testimony against me was the executive director of the abortion clinic. There were no women complaining because they were all getting the help they needed. They were happy. But the abortion clinic ex uh, executive director got up and testified. It turns out that she lied. And we said, oh, my goodness, just play the videotape. Well, somehow the abortion clinic lost their videotape. Their security company couldn't recover it. Something went wrong. But Eva, this is where God stepped in. It turned out that I had videotape. There were two days that I was videotaping what it was like for me to be on the public sidewalk so I could take it back to my church, show my members what it was like to be on the public sidewalk, they had to remain nonviolent if they were going to be effective on the sidewalk. So I wanted them to see 
exactly what it was like. Oh my goodness. It turned out that those two days, those random two days I picked, turned out to be the exact two days that I would need in court. And when we played the videotape in court, it impeached her entire testimony. And yet, what was the outcome of the trial? <laughs> it, it didn't matter. It had already been concluded that mm -hmm. I had to go to jail no matter what. I mean, even the bailiffs were saying, bro, they just throwing you in jail. And I so, know. And, and, the, and what, what I found amazing is that um, they offered you, and in fact, you could tell that the judge did not want to put you in jail. Um, they offered you, you know, as long as you promise not to go back to the sidewalk and not to do that any longer, that you would not get any jail time. And what did you say? <laughs> yeah, there, there was a backdoor deal, under the table deal. And they said, if you plead guilty, then we won't send you to jail. Plead guilty, we, we, you'll have to pay a fine and you'll have to accept three years of probation. Well, I, I wasn't going to plead guilty. I, I, I wasn't. And oh my goodness, they got angry and angrier and angrier when I wouldn't take the deal. I know, I know. It was it was amazing. And that the, at the end, because you wouldn't take any deal, because I think they even offered you a couple of deals, and because you wouldn't take any of them, you wouldn't plead guilty, you yep. wouldn't promise not to go back to the clinic and, and all of that, they finally sentenced you to 30 days in jail. And I just remember being there and just, I mean, I think all of the pro-lifers who were there um, or heard about it, and it, it was just a shock because it was so obvious that you were number one, innocent, and number two, that it was an unjust law. And so, okay, so the best part, I think, to me of this book is your jail journal. I'm telling you, Walter, it says touch my heart so much to read all about what happened in there. Because just so everybody knows, uh, Walter was doing a 40 day fast. He had started that before he went into jail. And basically what you were just drinking um, juice, that was it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was in jail and it turned out that the, the fellas were curious about why I was in jail. And so then the paper came out and yeah, I was the preacher in the paper that was in jail. So they started talking to me. Well, well ultimately we ended up having a prayer at midnight like Paul and Silas. And we had a group that was going on and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And eventually that got to be a, a, a problem, <laughs> but we, <laughs> we refused. Uh, to stop and we kept witnessing and so many men in jail actually came to Christ during the time I was there. And wasn't there even a story, I think um, one of my favorite stories I think was one when, when one of the inmates that was brought in, I guess he was just so yep. terrified and so shaken up that he was just screaming and inconsolable and everybody tried to console him from you know the guards and the inmates and and nobody uh could console this guy and he was just screaming and yelling and if the guards even came to you and asked for your help so tell them about they that part <laughs> they did they did uh it, the the guards knew that uh, i was in there in jail for a law they had never heard of. It took them a, a while to even get the law on the books. But there was this one inmate who was just unconsolable. And so they put him in solitary confinement. And then they went and got me. I had this reputation. They went and got me and put me in solitary confinement with him. And my job was to help him to stop crying. And oh my goodness, uh, we had an incredible time there. God was simply amazing. Yeah, no, I, that was a, that was an incredible story. Um, and then again, another favorite part of the story for me, anyway, um, is is reading about um, Elder Rowe and how <laughs> Elder Rowe, your protector in jail, another inmate. Yep. What a guy. And, and just, just the fact he was apparently a really big guy and yep. he, he took you under his wings and he was your protector. 
And what, what I found amazing is even after you got out, you stayed in touch with him, right? Are you still in touch with him or what's the latest on him? Yeah, no, I mean, I have got a letter from him that's about two months old now, but we're still in, and he's no longer in jail. He, he got out earlier yeah. uh, th this year. So we're, we're awfully excited uh, about that. But I tell you, El Dero on multiple occasions literally saved me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'll never forget, I'll always appreciate, you know, his physical presence. And it was a physical, was a physical presence, presence that saved me while I was in jail. Yeah, no, it's it's an incredible story. And, and hopefully one of these days, Walter, I'd love to meet him. <laughs> so maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe we can uh, have, a, so. have a lunch or dinner or something. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, that so would be great. so anyway, so now you're um, you you got you got let out early before good behavior. So how long were you in jail to, in total time? Well, Eva, to, to, let's, let's set the record straight. I was facing four years in jail, and because we played the videotape and everybody in the court saw it, it was all packed. The media was there. They they realized they didn't have the case they thought they had. So the judge reduced it to 30 days, you know, trying to make up for all of that. But it turns out that I told the judge that as soon as I get out, I'm coming right back. I believe that an unjust law was no law at all. And I was coming right back to help the women. Well, I had to endure a second sentencing, which is completely against the law. I had already been sentenced. Even the Oakland city attorney said, nah, I can't go that far. And oh my goodness, in the end, I accepted the, uh, the the original sentence. I was in jail for 30 days. I got out after like 19 or 20 days in jail, but all my time, my time in there, I was fasting and praying for the 40 Days for Life campaign that was going on while I was in jail. Yes, and your health really took the toll on you uh, because you basically... Oh. You only had those yeah. little apple um, juices that the prison serves. And, and it was kind of a nice story when the other inmates started giving you their juices. And then there <laughs> yeah. was that one time that you got a bad one and it made you really sick and you had to go to the infirmary. And so that was another story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We could go on. I, I, they didn't believe anybody was ever fasting. Mm -hmm. and, but after, after a while, they saw me fasting. And then I was taking the meal I got and I was giving it to the brothers and they loved it. And so they were bringing me juices. But I didn't know that I needed to look in the juice to make sure it wasn't molded yeah. and that it wasn't you know, ready to, to drink, proper for someone to drink it. I was just thirsty. I was fasting. I just poured it down. And ultimately, I was at literally facing death one night while I was in jail. I know. Yeah, it was so scary. Oh, my goodness gracious. But OK, so then, you know, you get out of jail. And so what happens next? What 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 in terms of legalities? I mean, you, this is not the end of the story. So uh, what can you um, encapsulate for us how the law was finally thrown out, et cetera? Well, it, uh, ultimately we went to the Ninth Circuit and we were going to move on to the Supreme Court. We, we didn't think that the Ninth Circuit was pro-life and they're not. We didn't think we had a chance. And so we were all ready to go to the Supreme Court. But they understood that if we got in front of the Supreme Court, we had a, we had a very solid case. There was nothing they could really stand on. They, Planned Parenthood had promised the Supreme Court with this other Supreme Court decision, Colorado v. Hill, that they wouldn't abuse anybody's First Amendment right. Well, they had abused mine, and they literally admitted that while they were in the Ninth Circuit in court. Well, when the Ninth Circuit understood that my First Amendment rights were violated, they changed everything. They forced Oakland to retrain all their police officers. But as a, I don't know, as a gift to the city of Oakland, they let them keep the law, but they made the law apply to everyone. In the beginning, beginning it, only, it only applied to whoever they thought they ought to apply it to. And that had to change. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and the, as of, as we speak right now, the bubble law is no longer there. Do you still go out to the clinics at all to pray or what, what is your latest uh, situation on that? Well, 
the, the last time I was out there was the, was the time that the clinic closed. And I'm so glad the clinic is, is finally closed. And I spend most of my time speaking now. I, I spend uh, most of my time on the road somewhere speaking at a pro-life event. So that's kind of your full-time job now is to defend life. And uh, you, you and Lori, that's, uh, in fact, speaking of Lori, I have to say, Walter, that reading some of her speeches um, in the book, I'm, those speeches can be taken and, and published separately and they, they are so powerful. What, a, what an elegant speaker your w darling wife is. Is Lori there? Can she say hi to us? <laughs> is she uh, behind you somewhere? I, I <laughs> yeah, she's she's in the she's in the other room, oh, but okay. I, I don't think she's going to come. To <laughs> okay, well, tell her that tell her that I'm rereading it and reading her speeches. You know, like when you got out, she gave a talk, and 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 during the hearings, you know, when it was open to the public and people could go talk, and and she, it's just amazing how powerful a speaker she is. And so you got you two make quite the pair. <laughs> I tell you, I, I couldn't do this without her. I love her dearly, and thank you for saying that. Yeah, I know, and please, please do give us give her our best, because I know for a fact that it just from, you know, when we went to visit you in jail, we went with her, and, and I know how she was with you every step of the way. I think, didn't she even write a letter to you every day while you were in jail? Like, I mean, she, she did. She visited me so often that one of the inmates said, hey, man, it looks like it's better to have a wife than a girlfriend. And so he started rethinking marriage. And oh we had a great conversation about that. Wow, that, I did not know that one. That's, that's a great story too. Okay, so since you've been out, how has the, the black pastors in your area, have, have, have they reached out to you? Have, uh, do you have a good relationship with them? What is the current situation? The, the current situation is that the black pastors are still trapped in supporting uh, abortion. I understand why there's, there's four reasons why black leadership rejects the pro-life movement, but we've been able to put together a program that's now number one in the country. And so we're awfully excited about it. And we're just gonna keep working hard to make that program more available to more pastors. So what is the biggest hurdle um to get the, um, the black community to behind the pro-life movement. What do you think is the, the biggest hurdle? Why, why do we not see too many pro-life um, black activists? Well, the number one reason black leadership rejects the pro-life movement, the number one reason is that black leadership is post-abortive. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, they're, they're blood guilty. They, they, they haven't confessed it. They haven't asked for forgiveness. Uh, they're just dealing with it. And if you don't know that the leader is post-abortive, you can talk to him, you can share with him and give him all the information that you have available, but that's not why he's supporting abortion. He, he needs to deal with that sin. He needs to confess that and deal with that. And until he does, uh, he's not gonna support the pro-life movement. And do you think that also that a lot of their congregations are post, po probably post-abortive? Oh, post Oh, absolutely. If he's a black pastor, a black church, with the, black the numbers, numbers surrounding the black community and abortion, perhaps the entire church is post-abortive. Yeah, that's 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 very sad. Um, after you got out, I think it was after you got out, you started the um, For Life Foundation, uh, um, Issues for Life Foundation, um, which I'm very happy to support, and I we most of us support that. Um, but I was recently on your site and I saw a video that you put out that called Lynched by the Klan. Can you tell us that story? That was a powerful story. And then tell us in a nutshell what you, what you said in that video. Well, uh, essentially my great grandfather was lynched by the Klan. He had 14 kids and I, I won't tell you what they did to his, his wife, my great grandmother, because you know we're in polite company. But oh my goodness, they, they lynched him. They set the house on fire. They were gonna burn all 14 kids alive. Well, the kids on the inside saw their parents were lost. And what they decided to do was that if the house got high enough and hot enough with the fire, the clan that had surrounded the house, they figured they would leave thinking nobody could survive. 
Well, the plan sort of worked. Seven of the children were burnt alive, and just one of the survivors was happened to be my grandmother. And that story had a huge, huge impact on my life. And that the seven children that survived, are you saying that uh, that their mother also perished? No, I'm saying that of the seven that survived, one of them became my grandmother. Right, but when your great-grandfather was lynched, did they also kill your great-grandmother or was she spared? Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, they, they killed her too, but I, I, what they made, what they did to her is really bad. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, let's not talk really, about really that. Bad. I read about it, and I, I, that it's too, it's it's too horrific. Let's just say that it was horrific. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's really bad. I I'd be happy to talk to you about uh, it, but it gets pretty ugly. I know. I I read about it from Lori's post, and and and. Oh my goodness! What a what what a horrible situation! Did your did your grandmother talk a lot about it, or did, how did you find out that all this did it get passed well, down through the generations? It got passed down. My mom was talking to me about it. You see, we we were facing these obstacles. You know, my dad broke the color line in NFL in, in the late '60s. Yeah. He became the very first Black American to work in the front office. They had players in the 60s, but none of us could work in the front office. That could, couldn't happen. Well, my dad was facing such racism and, and in order to kind of help us understand that things weren't as bad as they seemed, my mother shared that story with us. And when I understood that we've really come a long way, we've really made a lot of progress, uh, that really helped me make some adjustment personally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure I could not. In fact, um, in this book, um, speaking of your family, there's lots of pictures, uh, family pictures and football yeah. pictures. Walter, yeah. There's Walter, uh, Walter playing football. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> so, and here's Walter and Lori at their wedding. <laughs> so oh, this is this I love her. Of, I love her. Yeah, yeah. She, she's wonderful. Boy, Lori is something... <laughs> Well, we only have a few minutes left, but I really want to make sure to ask you, obviously, on what your thoughts are about what's happening in the country today, the Black Lives Movement, and how, you know, how it's been taken over. Um, so what are your thoughts about what's happening in the world today? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of, of the Black Lives Matter movement at all. Their uh, leadership is Marxist. They're anti-Christ, anti-church, and they're employing strategies that they know will not work for the betterment of anybody. I mean, if you want to find out a strategy that worked, just go back to the 60s. The civil rights movement was led by a Christian, a black Baptist preacher. The church was involved. Christ was lifted up. Matter of fact, everybody came together. All churches came together and marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. I marched with Dr. Martin Luther King in Detroit and Chicago as a little boy. The strategies they're using now are strategies they didn't know will never work. They'll never yield the type of results we're hoping for. And so it's pretty clear to me that Black Lives Matter is not about real effective change. They got another agenda, yeah, they, a darker agenda altogether. Yeah, it seems to me like what, what what's happening is is it's inevitable that it'll turn hearts against them because you know of the violence and the looting and the rioting, which I know that could not all be Black Lives Matter protesters, but uh, it it seems I it can't it can't I can't fathom how it's helping the movement, how how it's helping um, black it's generations by destroying their property and all the killing that's going on and and. I just wish there was something we could do. Do you have any ideas on how we can rectify what's happening today? Well, I, I, the Issues for Life Foundation needs to move forward with, with its program. We, we literally take pastors away from their office. We take them away from the city. We take them to a secret location. He can't come unless he brings his wife. And then for four days in our secret location, we pour into them. Oh my goodness. And at the end of four days, we've literally moved black leadership from A to B. Wow, good for you, Walter. That's wonderful. It's all secret, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It it's it's secret. 
And I, I wish I could tell everybody, but it wouldn't be a secret. But if they want to support us, I'd really appreciate that, though. Well, yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. We should point out that anyone who's listening, they could go to um, issuesforlife.org, right? Issues, yep. number four, issuesforlife.org. And you can see all these videos that Walter has, all the programs. And Walter, every year, organizes uh, the Oakland Walk for Life the day yes, before. Yes our San Francisco Walk for Life. So we have had this um, sister events going every year and we'll see if it's gonna happen next year with this COVID thing. We don't know um, what, the, what yeah. the law is going to be next year, but uh, it's always so great to have that, that um, sister events, you know, like, like, like two bookends, you know, and uh, we yeah. cover the Bay Area with our events. So thank you for doing that, Walter. Well, the Walk for Life West Coast is my all-time favorite pro-life event. And I got to say this real quick. I want to tell everybody how much I love Archbishop Corleone. Yeah. Archbishop Corleone actually went to visit you in jail, right? <laughs> he sure did. And yeah. oh, my goodness, I got a chance to learn a lot. Yeah, because I remember um, he was at that time just Bishop of Oakland. That was before he came right. to San Francisco. Right. Right. And I think it was Dolores or somebody who told him uh, about you. And he came to the jail and visited you. And then when you got out, you guys had meetings. And so, yeah, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a brotherly love. <laughs> um, oh, absolutely. From, from then on, he's been nothing but a blessing to me. I know. He, he's, he's done a lot of good work. Um, okay, so very last thing. Um, what about what advice would you give to people who are reluctant to go pray in front of an abortion clinic who need mm. the um need the encouragement to do it what what tips can you give them since you were so successful well i, I would simply say this go <laughs> your your very presence alone will make make a difference and then maybe uh, you could create something that's easy for them to digest. Like my sign just simply said, God loves you and your baby, let us help you. And that was alone, alone enough to attract women to come up and talk to me and then help them. Be prepared to help. I think if they do those three things, you know, a lot of good things are going to happen. Yes, I, I know, because when we go out, we, we have a Planned Parenthood here in San Francisco also, we always make sure to take our little brochures with us that, you know, that Very say good. where they can get help, or, you know, where they can get free testing and et cetera like that. So, yeah, you, yeah it's very important. And what, uh, and do you think the homemade signs are better? Because um, I think yours was, you just hand wrote it, right? You just wrote a... It, it, it was a gift, but it was handwritten. It was really from Australia. Oh, my goodness. And I had no idea the sign would become that popular, but the sign literally asked the three most asked questions I would get. And so the sign was perfect. And do you still have that sign? I sure do. I sure do. I, every once in a while when I'm out, uh, I, people will ask me to bring it. And so I'll get a chance to, to bring with me while I'm up speaking. Well, that's great because, yeah, that that's, uh, was a powerful sign, quite obviously, with all the success that you had at the at the clinic where this whole city had to come out against you and create laws because of you and you, you and your sign. So because and also because you had uh, your partner was an 87 year old um, lady from your <laughs> parish. Is that correct? Yeah, I had two senior women with me and they were 80 pushing 90. And oh my goodness, uh, they were fantastic. That was one of the reasons why we videotaped so that we could show everybody in the church what it was like, because I was trying to build up my pro-life team in church. Yeah. Well, Walter, thank you so much for giving us your time. And again, everybody, please check out this book, Black and Pro-Life in America. It's uh, Walter's story. It goes into full detail about what happened to him, why it happened to him, who did the happening, what happened afterward. It, it talks about uh, Elder Rowe and, and all the other people oh, in yeah. the jail and all love the stories it. from the jail. So. Walter, we want to thank you, and I love you with all my heart, and give our best to oh. Lori, and we hope to see you very soon. Any other final words from you? Well, I would simply want to say that without life, nothing matters. 
you can have a job waiting on you, you can have education waiting on you, you can have a family waiting on you when you get out the womb. But if you can't get out the womb without life, nothing matters. Amen, brother. Amen. And we'll see you at the Walk for Life. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. God bless you, Walter. And hello to Lori. Thank you, Eva. God bless you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.